الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وسيدنا أبو القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين. Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining me from the holy city of Karbala, and we're back on your show, Back to the Basics, in which we are discussing some of the key issues between us and others when it comes to maintaining a sophisticated, respectable and nonetheless necessary dialogue with those who might question our beliefs or differ with us on major points of, dare I say, worldview or even creedal doctrines. Throughout this show, we've been attempting to come up with a framework by which we can avoid entering into the nitty gritty subtleties, which are often the ventures that we enter into when discussing with anyone. For indeed, many of our discussions have been very reactionary. That is to say, we have allowed others to dictate the way in which we are discussing. Over the past few episodes, we have discussed the concept of our aqidah as not merely a set of abstract, isolated beliefs, but rather as a complete package. And it is this assertion that we are comparing worldviews as opposed to isolated beliefs. That is to say, we are returning back to the bigger questions, the questions that shape and govern our very way of thinking, that has been the constant train of thought throughout the previous episodes. I have demonstrated I believe that the Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all, the true successors of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, laid out a framework by which they wished for us to follow, a framework which depended upon us taking the very principles of others and applying those principles consistently to see where they end up leading us. And in many ways, this was done in order to reduce the opposing arguments to what we could call absurdity, or a level in which we could see that this argument is not going anywhere. Of course, this is not done according to our subjective whims. This is not done according to, well, Shiism teaches this and another doctrine teaches that. I don't like that, therefore I'm going to reject it because it goes against this. That's arbitrary, and that's unfortunately how many of our discussions have been going in the previous years. Many of the discussions which we see take place on YouTube or other social media venues, they tend to take this form. Rather, we wish to stay away from that form and we wish to take a more objective method in analyzing these differences. Of course, the very study of what it means to believe in anything is something which is discussed rather succinctly in any major theological works or works of rational theology. And this is known as the study of epistemology. What does that word mean? Epistemology is a, it's an English word, but it comes from the Greek word episteme, to mean knowledge. And it refers to a, frame, a framework or theory of knowledge, which allows us to understand what provides us with knowledge or a level of certainty. What are the sources of human knowledge? And any book of rational theology in the Arabic language, any sophisticated Muslim scholarly work, regardless of the sect, engages with this topic quite thoroughly. It's called in the Arabic language, Navariyat al-Ma'rfa, a theory of knowledge. Again, how do we know things? And that is indeed the very pinpointing question which we have advanced towards different worldviews. One of the first questions is, what is the nature of human beings? One of the second questions is, what is the nature of our knowledge? How do we gain knowledge? Can we trust that knowledge that we gain? And we've discussed how when one reduces the human mind or the intellect, the very thing we use to gain knowledge to something which cannot be trusted, then what we have is a very deficient, uncertain, shaky, and dare I say blind faith based worldview. And such a worldview would never make the cut in a sophisticated scholarly discussion. So it is my contention that there are certain worldviews which necessarily, even if they do not say it outright, would lead to this particular issue. We've already seen that this is the case with the Salafi school of Islamic theology or the Athari school of Islamic theology, which postulates that whilst we can apparently trust our intellects, we are, we are to believe in a deity whose very nature and very attributes would cause us to believe in rational absurdities. 
Due to this fact, we would have to reject such a worldview as a worldview that brings nothing to the table. And in last night's episode, I began discussing how, likewise, the new belief, or rather, I should rephrase that, it's not a new belief, it has existed throughout human history, but rather the ideology which presents itself as atheism, and particularly the newest form of atheism or scientific materialism, is likewise a worldview which renders human knowledge to be something which cannot be trusted. Now, in last night's episode, I laid out a slight pretext by introducing the fact that many atheists will sincerely take objection to what I am saying. Why so? An atheist may come forward and say, look, at the end of the day, atheism is not a comprehensive worldview. It's merely the absence of a belief in a deity. It's literally just a negation of theism, namely the belief in a god, and it's a single belief. You can't claim it's a worldview. You have atheists who follow one worldview and atheists who follow another. Whilst their claim is intrinsically true, and in practice we do find atheists who do happen to claim and believe that their atheism or their rejection of a god is merely the rejection of one belief, we find that a consistently minded person would indeed understand that if you reject something major, like the existence of God, the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal, there are to be several ramifications. Ramifications which will affect everything else that you believe. And what I mean by stating such is that we don't have merely an isol isolated set of beliefs in life. Everything has a necessary consequence. So for example, if I believe that there is a God who will hold me accountable on the day of judgment, then it would necessarily impact how I treat people when that God has issued a command and I go against that command. Or for example, if I believe that human beings are upright in their nature and have certain rights over me, and likewise animals have certain rights over me, because these rights are naturally grounded within my theology, then I will treat human beings and animals in a certain way which is befitting of that belief system which I hold. So likewise, we would say to the atheist who argues that their belief system is not really a belief system, but rather just a single belief of no God existing, that not believing in a God will likewise have major ramifications, which inshallah ta'ala, I hope we can go into further depth into tonight. There are many atheists who argue that to reject a God is simply in the same way that a believer in Islam rejects the gods of Hinduism, for example, or rejects the gods of other religions which do not happen to follow the same Abrahamic monotheistic model. They would say that in the same way that you reject those gods and it doesn't affect you in your other beliefs, likewise, our rejection of your god should not affect us in our beliefs either. But is this really the case? Or is there something much more to it? Several atheists throughout history, we began by citing some of them yesterday, have led us to understand that there is a giant dilemma for the atheists when it comes to a system or theory of knowledge by which knowledge can be truly grounded. And what I mean by that is that when you reject the presence of a divine creator, there are certain ramifications. One of those ramifications would be that you would now have to question certain key assumptions you, you hold, which have been given to us by human society and were once premised upon the belief in a divine creator. So allow me to give a few examples. I, as someone who is from a traditionally and predominantly, historically, Christian society, would have been raised with certain notions about life about how to treat others, about morality, which are necessarily grounded within a Christian background, within a Christian historical context. 
One of those concepts would be, for example, the concept of human rights. For me to believe that human beings are excluded amongst other things and have a set of rights, as a Western belief, of course, I'm not saying that Islam does not have its own framework for human rights, but I'm giving an example to show how one is raised with a certain belief and might not necessarily know the reason for why they hold that belief. The reason that many of us believe in human rights in the West is because traditionally the West has been governed by Christianity, which has held the concept known as Imago Dei, that human beings are created and are uniquely created within the image of God, and therefore that this belief entails that human beings have certain exclusive rights and have a certain sanctity. This is what has led for many Christians to believe in the concept of human rights. I'm not stating that this belief is incorrect or correct here. Of course, Islam does not believe that we are created in the image of God, at least not be pure Islam, and not in the sense that Christians argue at the very least. But I'm just giving an example. So likewise, these pre-existing beliefs I have, which have been shaped by society, have specific roots which are grounded in bigger questions. They are not merely something which I have come to the rational conclusion of. Now, of course, today that's not very politically correct because someone might turn around and say, well, what do you mean you don't believe in human rights? Of course, I do believe in human rights because at the end of the day, my worldview has a good metaphysical grounding for human rights. But I might ask the question to the atheist, why do you believe in human rights? Because at the end of the day, if we have merely evolved in a giant genetic soup alongside the other animals in the animal kingdom, then surely we're no different from those and we should really be treating ourselves and the animals in a very similar manner. We should not have any more rights than them. But I will elaborate more on that argument, inshallah ta'ala, after a quick break which we're going to take now. If you can bear with me, I would be very grateful. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Viewers, thank you for joining me once more. Before we break, I was discussing how certain pre-existing conceptions that are within a society are grounded within the world view of that society. But somehow, we as people who grow up in that society, despite the fact that we've radically shifted from that original world view, may very well take these beliefs to be granted, but not have a decent, rational basis for those beliefs. Now, there is a very arbitrary way, a very ad hoc way, of dealing with this set of beliefs, which is to argue things along the lines of, well, I believe that because they exist. Human rights merely exist, and everyone recognizes human rights. But that's not providing an account for human rights. And we've already stated that any decent worldview needs to be able to offer some explanatory power for the existing phenomenon around us as human beings. But am I merely speaking as a biased believer who happens to have an agenda against atheism? Of course, I cannot deny that I affirm the existence of a God. I certainly do. I certainly do have good reason to be against atheism on that basis because at the end of the day, I believe in a God who I believe has the right to be worshipped, and therefore I would view atheism as a transgression against the nature of man and the rights of that deity. But I'm not the only one who states these things. In fact, I'm not by far the only one that states these things. These things have been recognized even by atheists themselves. Now, you might argue that, of course, there's an average Joe blogs out there, some random, who is going to fall prey to a believer's argument, but he's not representative of scholarly atheism. He's not a very intelligent guy because, by far, there's so many intelligent atheists out there, but it's impossible that we just dismiss their view. 
Well, let's look at this man's credentials. As I've said, we're very interested in the science known as epistemology, which is to actually study the conditions and sources of human knowledge. The gent that I wish to cite tonight is known as Dr. Alex Rosenberg. Who is Dr. Alex Rosenberg? Dr. Alex Rosenberg is the R. Taylor Cole Professor of Philosophy at Duke University. Duke University, of course, or as Americans would say, Duke University, but the correct original English pronunciation is Duke, is, of course, a renowned and pretty well-rated American university. It's not one of these Bible Belt Christian colleges or independent colleges, which I'm not dismissing as being bad, but I'm trying to affirm that it is a place of repute and renown. He is, of course, the professor of philosophy there, and he specializes in the philosophy of science. So he's hardly a small fish. He's a man that's very well respected in his field. He wrote a book which is entitled The Atheist's Guide to Reality. And this book is a very popular work of, dare I say, popular science and philosophy. One can find it in most Western bookshops. And it's sold very well. Dr. Rosenberg is by no means a friend of the believers. In fact, you'll find that he engages in academic and scholarly debates with believers in monotheism and indeed any form of theism. Dr. Rosenberg states quite succinctly in his book the following, and I quote verbatim, inshallah ta'ala, there is much more to atheism than its knockdown arguments that there is no God. There is the whole rest of the worldview. See, he, he even utilizes the same expression as I do, worldview, a very popular term in the philosophy of science coming from the original German word, Weltanschauung. Rest of a worldview that comes along with atheism. It's a demanding, rigorous, breathtaking grip on reality, one that has been vindicated beyond reasonable doubt. It's called science. So Rosenberg's entire theory about the worldview of atheism is that the correct atheist worldview is what's known as science. And by science, of course, he means scientism. The belief that the only true form of knowledge which can be obtained is knowledge of the scientific realm. That is to say, physics, biology, and chemistry. For Rosenberg, these are the main sources of knowledge, and anything else is not really knowledge, rather it's speculation. Now, this is extremely interesting. Rosenberg states, and again I'm going to quote it once more just in order to elaborate and vindicate the very claim I've been making. Now, some might say this is an appeal to authority, but rather I will try and elaborate on what Rosenberg's argument is as well to see that I'm not merely citing someone that agrees with my view. Rather, he has a laid out argument and what we're trying to do is engage with this argument. His argument is that if atheism is true, there is much more to it. If there is no God, then there is much more to there being no God than just an isolated belief that there is no God. It's not merely an argument against religious believers on the issue of God. Rather, he states, it's a demanding, rigorous, breathtaking grip on reality, one that has been vindicated beyond reasonable doubt. And he states that there is the whole rest of the world view. That is to say, there is a complete package of beliefs that comes with this absence of a belief in a deity. Now, this is what is stated by Rosenberg on page 8 of a book. Page 8, of course, being in Roman numerals. Now, in order to summarize what Rosenberg's entire worldview is, I'm going to quote a brief snippet of a book which he has included on many samples of his text which are available for those who do not even buy the book, such as the back cover of a book for those who peruse the book in bookshops. Rosenberg issues out 
answers to the big questions which we said dominate and dictate the very foundational pillars of any major worldview. What does he state? Allow me to quote. He states, question, is there a God? Rosenberg responds, no. Then he asks question, what is the nature of reality? Rosenberg states, whatever physics says it is. He doesn't say whatever, he says what physics says it is. So for Rosenberg, reality is merely our, understa our physical understanding of reality, whatever the science of physics says about reality. He says, what is the purpose of the universe? He states, what, there is none. Then he asks, what is the meaning of life? He says, ditto, again, there is no meaning of life. Why am I here, Dr. Rosenberg? He states, just dumb luck. Does prayer work, Dr. Rosenberg? Of course not. Is there a soul? Is it immortal? Are you kidding, asks Dr. Rosenberg. Is there free will? Do we have free will, Dr. Rosenberg? Do we have any choice in anything we do? Not a chance, says Dr. Rosenberg. What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before except us, he states. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, Dr. Rosenberg? This is a question he asks himself. His answer, there is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral, he asks. His answer is, because it makes you feel better than being immoral. So there's no real objective factor in it other than a degree of self-ingested benefit. You'll feel better. This is the reason. Is abortion, euthanasia, suicide, paying taxes, foreign aid, or anything else you don't like forbidden, permissible, or sometimes obligatory? That is to say, is there anything in the world which is forbidden, permissible, or sometimes obligatory? His response, anything goes. What is love and how can I find it? He responds, love is the solution to a strategic interaction problem. Don't look for it, it will find you when you need it. It's merely a process that goes on in the human body as part of a strategic problem finding strategy. Now, this is interesting. Does history have any meaning or purpose? It's full of sound and fury, but signifies nothing. Humanist history means nothing. This is the philosophical worldview of atheism for one of the greatest atheist professors of philosophy in the modern world. Dear viewers, thank you very much for joining me on this show. I'm sorry we were not able to cover as much as I would like, but inshallah ta'ala in tomorrow's episode we shall attempt to go further into these statements and we shall digest them fully, showing the ramifications of this and what it means for anyone who wishes to look at things rationally. Does this even retain its status as a rational belief? Thank you once more for joining me, dear viewers, and please pray for us from wherever you are, and we'll be praying for you from the holy city of Karbala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.